Welcome to Uprising Florence Avignon. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So first, tell us a little bit about your background before we get into your one-woman play, um, Making Us Whole, a tribute to literary activists. Uh, how much of your own education and childhood education has led you to where you are today writing and performing this play? Um, wonderful question. Um, I was influenced by writers who I discovered had experienced much of what I discovered as a kid. Uh, I grew up as a, a single uh, parent child, the youngest of four girls. Never saw my father ever. Um, we were on welfare. And so quite often you grow up thinking that there are potholes in your life. And then when you read literature, and there's some 12-year-old girl in New York going through the same thing that I'm going through, and yet they've overcome their struggle, and not only overcome their struggle, but they are thriving because they're writers and they're adults, you become inspired. And so literature had a huge impact in aiding me in overcoming my struggle or any of those potholes that I referenced as a kid. Mm. And so uh, a tribute to literary activists is how you describe your one-woman play. What is a literary activist? Well, you know, um, minority writers in particular often have a very unique story because what they do is identify the political, social, and economic struggles of our community. And that's sort of an activism, I believe, because quite often that was the only vehicle that many of them could actually express themselves through. When we think of like the Harlem Renaissance, and um, Langston Hughes is also referenced in my play. So I see them as literary activists because they use the power of the words to change, to mobilize, and to inspire urban communities. Mm. So what you're saying is that um, uh, somebody who comes from a community that as a whole experiences oppression right Writing is and just speaking out is in an in of in and of itself a, a form of uh, activism. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I think that quite often we hesitate to pay tribute to those individuals, just as modern day reporters are often activists because they expose and reveal struggles that are occurring throughout the world. And quite often we are hesitant to pay tribute to those individuals. And because my writers are getting up there in age, I don't like when we pay tribute to people once they leave us. Mm -hmm. Quite often that's when you hear of all the fanfare. Right. So I wanted it to personally pay tribute, to give my appreciation um, in this moment of me being honored as a teacher. I don't think I, I would be here without their literature and their inspiration. So I actually spoke with each of these uh, individual writers who are my highlighted uh, items in the play. That's Miss Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, and Intozaki Shange. And I felt very, very fortunate now as an adult person who was influenced as a kid to have them give me permission to share their works. Mm -hmm. So you did you grow up reading Nikki Giovanni and others? Absolutely. I grew up a very, uh, despite being a very poor and struggling as a young girl uh, four and three older sisters. I also grew up uh, in a household that in which I couldn't go outside very often. So literature became my social life. I became very active in sharing literature. I was on the speech team. I probably wouldn't have gotten through college if I wasn't on the speech team, and I won a couple of scholarships for speech. But it was just my vehicle to share the words of these various authors. And what did it feel like for you reading somebody like Maya Angelou and, and Nikki Giovanni as as a young girl, um, thinking about uh, the fact that these women were world-renowned, but in a very intimate way, speaking to you, not only as a, a, a woman, but as a black woman. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, it was my inspiration, and I think that's probably why I ended up teaching both history and English, mm. because definitely literature always has a historical reference, and I became intrigued by elements of history, and definitely the ability to have students get into a short story or a novel and have them make personal connections, and particularly the population that I teach. Um, quite often they feel as if they're the only ones going through their struggle. Literature teaches you that your struggle is global and that if someone over in uh, Somalia can overcome uh, violence, then you can too in your community. Mm -hmm. And I try to do that now as an educator, just as these authors were able to do that for me when I was a young girl. And I want to ask you about your experiences as a teacher, but first, uh, so tell us more about Making Us Whole. This is a one-woman play, mm -hmm. uh, and it features uh, some of the original works by these women that have inspired you. Yes. So how do you do? How do you put it all together? Yes. What is it? W what would listen who went to watch you expect on the stage? Right. Well, I am actually portraying about 12 different characters, mm -hmm. uh, a reverend, uh, a little girl, 
Um, I portray a woman who speaks out against the injustices and atrocities facing young girls throughout the world. Um, I have uh, very sassy women who talk about being able to be independent and not have uh, their spirit taken away by a man. So I play a myriad of characters and I do that intentionally. So you're laughing, you're dancing. It's definitely intertwined with music and the music is also uh, period pieces that will bring memories back from the, for the audience. And I also have dancing because I think uh, movement is a part of that expression. And it's sort of the tradition, I guess, again, of the Renaissance where you had music and movement as well as literature. I've tried to bring that back through this production. Um, I have teachers as dancers, some of the performers. There are three dancers. Uh, one of the dancers is actually a uh, former district teacher of the year. Mm. So I've intertwined uh, a great deal of art to bring literature to life. Um, I've, uh, I have a media element where there are um, news clips because what I've done is actually identify pieces of work that many people have never heard. While I do showcase some of the, shall I say, classical sections of uh, literature from Nikki and Langston, I also pay tribute to pieces that were very powerful but never heard. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to make sure people know how brilliant these authors have been. And so it's not just women authors? No, it's not. It's primarily women authors. Um, I have Peter Deanda, who had a wonderful play called Ladies in Waiting, and it's a monologue, a very poignant monologue um, about a woman and how she ends up in jail. I don't want to give away too much, but it's a very powerful piece. So Peter DeAnda and Langston Hughes, I think, are the only two, no, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So I have three males, but it's a preponderance of female authors. Can you share with our listeners an excerpt from this play, Making Us Whole, a tribute to literary activists? Great, definitely. Um, there's one powerful selection um, from a, a selection called Boogie Woogie Landscapes by Entozaki. This particular piece uh, addresses the atrocities women are facing throughout the world. So here's a brief excerpt. Even though gender is not destiny, right now being born a girl is to be born threatened. I want being born a girl to be a cause for celebration, a cause for protection and, and nourishment of our birthright, to live freely with passion, knowing no fear. We are born girls to live to be women who have our own lives, to live, to have our own lives, to live. We are born girls to live to be women. Florence Avignon is my guest performing a very tiny taste of her one woman play, Making Us Whole, a tribute to literary activists. The play has only four performances, March 24th and 25th, and then the 31st and April 1st at the Imagined Life Theater at 5615 San Vicente Boulevard in Los Angeles. And we'll give information about how you can get tickets a little bit later in the program, but performances are Saturdays and Sundays for two weekends in a row starting March 24th. Saturdays at 7 p.m., Sundays at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. Actually, so there's uh, there's three performances a day over four over the days. Weekend, yes. There we go. Uh, and um, so now tell us uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, this th how these pieces that you put together uh, that you got the permission from from these various authors. How did you link them and and uh, did you sort of stitch? Um, uh, some kind of a narrative or a trajectory throughout the play so that it makes sense from start to finish? Right. Well, sort of, but I didn't want to do the traditional sort of chronological approach. What I did were thematic looks, things that were, they may have been issues in the news, they may have been major, uh, for example, there's a, a, a selection in which uh, it's sort of humorous. The reverend is trying to talk about freedom, but it's during slavery. So um, it's humorous because while um, the only time slaves could often convene on the plantation was in church settings, and a lot of folks don't know that's why African American churches are so um, uh, popular in our community because it's a tradition, it's a 
historical, that was the only time slaves could convene, um, was for religious purposes. So that vehicle was used politically, and that's why I talk about the idea of literary activism, because Paul Lawrence Dunbar was brilliant in writing a sermon hmm. um, and having a reverend talk about freedom biblically, but actually trying to get the slaves to consider uh, getting their freedom. <laughs> well, let's talk a, a little bit about your teaching. You were announced as uh, one of the te California Teachers of the Year, and uh, you're a literary specialist uh, teacher at Phoenix Academy and the Los Angeles County Office of Education. What sort of, um, uh, how does your work kind of bring you in touch with kids that might be going through what you went through as a kid? Right. Well, I have been very, very fortunate for the last uh, 20 years. I uh, initially started with LA Unified at my alma mater, Crenshaw High School, um, I began to wonder what happened to those kids who were suddenly expelled or transferred. Um, as a result, I discovered they were incarcerated or um, sent to other sites because they couldn't um, come onto regular school grounds. And so I opted to teach that population of students. So I presently teach um, students who are actually in drug rehabilitation facilities. They live there. Um, prior to this year, I taught at Central Juvenile Hall, which is an, an incarcerated facility. Um, these students, more than any, need to be inspired. Um, Why did you want to teach them? Well, one, I always like teaching those students that students, teachers often feel are no longer teachable. So or the students that we all give up on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I do that because I guess I have seen so many miracles. Um, while at Crenshaw, I had students in foster care um, who were active on my speech team, and that involvement gave them hope. I guess very much like basketball, I'll give some young men hope, and football, the ones who don't have fathers, it becomes their vehicle for having role models and so forth. Um, I found that art is an outlet for a lot of students, and I had a lot of poets um, um, both in Central as well as Crenshaw, and they just needed an outlet for the poetry. Um, so I've used literature as a tool to awaken hope in students. I've used it as a tool for students to get up and express themselves, very much like, and I reference this in my play, rap. Um, while many students absolutely adore hip-hop, uh, and Tupac in particular, a lot of them don't know that he began as a poet, that he actually went for a to a school for the arts, and that his love was poetry and performance. And so once I get them to understand that um, expressing themselves is a vehicle to get rid of anger, and that that was one of the vehicles that uh, poets like Tupac and other hip-hop artists use, they begin to get more into literature. They begin to delve more into connecting with authors and short stories. Um, they begin to find personal connections to stories that may be classics but still have some connection to their personal struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am very honored each day to use um, my gift as a teacher to give hope to students. Um, and I really see teaching as a vehicle to building my future, not just their future. Finally, Florence Avignon, you mentioned that when you were a child, you, uh, you're, you're a child of a single parent and yes. you uh, were on welfare. And it's, yes. you know, it's amazing because this concept of welfare is constantly in the news these days, ever since Reagan right. and uh, Clinton and, and now the demonization of welfare yes. as some kind of handout or freebie that uh, that ordinary struggling people are getting right. um, how does that make you feel as somebody right. who who you know needed help from the government absolutely and got it absolutely and you know you're still here you're working you're teacher of the year absolutely <laughs> absolutely well I think I wonderful I, I really think people do not understand one um, I think Part of the issue with not understanding welfare is not understanding the fact that we live in this wonderful nation in which we're supposed to help those individuals who aren't unable to help themselves completely. Um, For no fault of their own, usually. Abso right? Absolutely. I mean, because the, the, the uh, attitude is, if you're on welfare, it's because you're lazy, or you're on welfare and it's going to make you lazy. <laughs> and I think that sort of erases the historical reference as to why certain populations um, have historically needed welfare. Mm -hmm. And that's from, as a history teacher, we can't ignore that. And even when I teach history, I always advocate to students that let's understand why and then figure out solutions as to how to move on. Um, 
there's a reason why I had to grow up on welfare. My mom had to stop school early because she lived in a, a city in which people like her, African Americans, couldn't get the best jobs. And uh, she had to assist her mom. And as a result, um, like many other students, they couldn't afford to continue schooling because they needed to work. Ironically, even my mom preferred that I get a job instead of going to college because she thought that was much more of a secure financial backing. So welfare created this opportunity for me because I realized that um, I was given something to assist me. Right. And as a result, I now needed to assist others. So uh, while I made it a point to avoid going back on welfare because I used a public education in order to allow me to become successful, I realized that it was this rotation of my nation helped me, now I help my nation. And that was the concept of me using public assistance and free education to become an independent individual who could now come back and pull someone else up. And if we remove those opportunities, then we're removing opportunities to some, for somebody else to be engineer of the year or another teacher of the year mm -hmm. or a lawyer of the year. Well, Florence Avignon, I want to wish you the best of luck with your play and with your teaching. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you.